you joined us for last summer's book study, then you're in for a treat because I had the opportunity to interview Peter Lilliedahl, author of Building Thinking Classrooms. We had a fantastic discussion about overcoming the roadblocks that keep us stuck when creating a thinking classroom, as well as why we should shift the lens through which we read and implement the book. He also shared some new insights he's had since releasing the book and seeing it implemented in thousands of classrooms. Let's dive into the interview. Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. It is such an honor to have you on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I've been looking forward to this, actually. Yes, as of I and everybody in the Mix and Math community, I would love for us to get started by just give us like the 30 second elevator pitch of Building Thinking Classrooms, just to kind of frame our discussion today. So Building Thinking Classrooms is, is a reaction to a, a, a documented reality that students spend a huge amount of their classroom time not thinking. And that this is problematic because if students are not thinking, they're not learning. And it's, there's also an observed reality that classrooms haven't really changed much in, the, much in the last 150 years. And what happens in classrooms hasn't really changed much in, a, in the last 150 years. So these three observations coming together uh, and creating this realization for me that if everywhere I go, I see these sort of institutionally static norms of classrooms and classroom practice that hasn't changed much, and I see students not thinking, then if we need, if we want to get students to think, we're going to have to change some of these norms. And, and that's what building thinking classrooms is really, is about, it's research-based, but it's really about what are the changes we need to make inside of our classroom so that students can start to think. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it, Building Thinking Classrooms right now, there's like all the hype around it because your book was released. Goodness, what year? I've got the book right here in front of me. What year was it actually released or published? It was actually released in October of 2020. So, you <laughs> know, releasing timing. a book on classroom practice in the middle of a pandemic is maybe not the best time to do that, but I think it turned out okay anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So 2020, so it's three, four years old now, and there's all this hype around it, but I actually want to take you back 20 years because this is not new, this is not a new thing for you. I actually came yeah. across one of your research articles that you did in 2004 about um, students' aha moments. And at the end of that oh, research yes. article, you said, how can we orchestrate our students' learning environments to best facilitate the potential for illumination? And illumination, I took that as to be like those aha moments. And so I'd love to know how your early research around students' belief in, in themselves as learners um, has motivated or inspired you in the work that you do now with building thinking classrooms. Wow. Okay, that was that was a good. <laughs> I'm find. taking you back twenty. Years. I don't even remember. I don't even remember <laughs> writing that at the end of that article. It it was foreshadowing, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny. For a long time, I had seen these research agendas as different, in a sense. Um, my PhD work was on creativity and mathematics, the aha moment in particular, and, and how the aha moment aligns with ideas like creativity, discovery, illumination, and how it's different from things like imagination and intuition. So I was working very much in what John Dewey referred to as the extra logical processes, right? Like, so if we think about math as super logical, I was working on the fringes, which is like, what are the extra logical, the non-logical processes of, of mm. doing and learning mathematics? Um, yeah. It was a, I was fascinated by that and it really carried me through my PhD. And that was my thesis was on the aha experience. And then at the same time, I was starting to work on this real, I, I was starting to have this realization that students are not spending a lot of time thinking. And that led down this path of how do we create environments that get students to think. Now, the place that these two overlapped clearly, and I've always known they've overlapped, is through the, the important contribution that problem solving makes in both of these settings, right? So problem solving is the, the context you need to be in in order to have an aha experience. And problem solving is what we need to be doing in order to be thinking. Um, so there was that natural overlap. But you're not the first person who has pointed out similarities between 
that part of my work, the creativity part of my work and the, and the building thinking classroom part of my work in ways that I have myself hadn't actually made connections until, yeah. uh, until yeah. recently. That aha moment. I was fascinated when I saw that that was the work that you were doing, you know, 20 years ago, because I love that. That's something that I talk about a lot, I think. Um, but I, I really focus on it from the teacher's perspective because, you know, and in, in that research article, you were working with pre-service teachers. And, you know, I, I wonder, as you were studying their belief as themselves as learners, I wonder if you noticed that there were any beliefs that teachers have that either play like a really positive or negative role in their ability to effectively create a building or a, create a thinking classroom. Aside from creativity, I've also spent 20 years doing research into affect beliefs, attitudes, emotions, identity, um, these sorts of emotional responses to our experiences in the math classroom. And one of the primary areas that I've been doing research in is teacher beliefs, because, you know, there's been this huge push, especially in the U.S., around the knowledge for teaching and what is the knowledge that teachers need uh, in order to become effective teachers. Um, and I've always kind of pushed a counter narrative, which is that, yeah, knowledge is important, but so too are beliefs. Because at the level of action in the classroom, it doesn't matter if it's a belief or if it's knowledge. It's, it's still affecting what we do in the classroom. Now, when it comes to beliefs, uh, and in particular, beliefs about mathematics, there are sort of three main held beliefs. And this comes from Paul Ernest. Uh, who sort of laid down these ideas. So the first one is the view that math is a toolkit, right? It's, it provides us with a set of tools that we use and we apply in, in different contexts, right? So we learn how to factor, we learn how to measure, we learn how to add, we learn how to divide. These are all just tools that we're going to use in, in, in situ somewhere else. Uh, the second belief is that math is some sort of a formal language. Um, and, and that is that math is something that, that is built upon rigorous deductive logic, that proof is the, the language of deduction, and that formal structures are incredibly important in mathematics. And the third belief is that math is discovered. That math is something that is a verb. It's something we engage in and we, and through engagement, we discover things, we, we make connections, we, we find relationships, whether those are new to the world or just new to us. And often that is seen as a platonic view of mathematics, but at a more local level, it's just that sort of, that aha that we have when we discover things. So these three beliefs, each really strongly shape what kind of a teacher we are, right? So if I believe math is a toolkit, then we're marching through those tools and we're trying to develop them. And in many ways, curriculum is written this way, right? It's like, we're going to fill your toolbox. And then every year we're going to take these tools out and we're going to polish them up. And we're going to put them back in the toolbox. And every once in a while we add a new tool, but then we take out the, another one, we polish it up and put it back in. If we view math as a formal language, then we're going to be very much about the proofs. And we can imagine what that lecture at the beginning of a lesson is going to be all about. Let me prove to you why this is true and, and, and so on and so forth. And we see elements of this in geometry around proof that is still hold, held in our curriculum. And if we believe math is a verb and it's about discovery, then we're going to have a much more student-centered, problem-based approach to teaching. So what our beliefs are about what mathematics is, is going to shape the kinds of experiences we create for students. But students themselves also have beliefs about mathematics, right? Yeah. And, and it shapes how they receive mathematics. So if they believe that math is a tool, it doesn't matter how, how much we try to push formal structure or we try to create discovery moments. They're waiting for us to put something in a box so that they can write that down because that's the thing they need to take away from. Right. So, so beliefs yeah, right. play an incredibly important role in the classroom, both as teachers and learners. I actually heard you on another podcast. I think it was with um, Make Math Moments. 
and you were talking about the conference in Indiana, and you said that the teachers there were treating building thinking classrooms like a problem to solve rather than a choreographed dance to master. Can you elaborate on that um, and just explain why treating building thinking classrooms like a problem to solve is so important? Right. Okay. So building thinking classrooms is a framework, first of all. It's not a recipe. It's not a manual. It's not a prescription that we're supposed to follow. It's it's a collection of data and stories that tells us what's not working and what is working. But we have to find a way to make it our own within our own context, right? And it's really important that teachers make it their own. Every single teacher who implements building thinking classroom implements it slightly differently. Some to better, greater effect and some to lesser effect, but, but you have to make it your own. Because if it's mine, if, it, if you're just trying to implement mine, then it's exactly that. I have this, I've created a dance, I've choreographed a dance, and now you have to learn to do the dance. That's not what Building Thinking Classrooms is at all. Um, it is a problem to solve. The problem is, here's the reality of what's not going well. Here's a complexity of trying to do something well. Um, and how am I going to bridge that space? How am I going to take myself and who I am and what my beliefs are and what my experience is and insert a, uh, a, a set of research results into my particular context, right? It's a problem to solve. Now, what's the best way to problem, solve a problem? You find someone to solve it with, then you work the problem. Right. And that's that's true of whether we have students problem solving in the classroom. But I think it's also true of teachers problem solving their practice. And that's why I'm so appreciative of the communities around building thinking classrooms that have sprung up. Right. The book study that you have led, the, the Facebook groups that exist, these conferences that have popped up on building thinking classrooms. These are collections of people coming together, trying to work the problem. And that's what, what building thinking classroom needs to be. Because if, just like in the classroom, if the teacher is the only keeper of knowledge, then the classroom has to move at my pace, right? It right. can never exceed the, the pace that I can, that I can set and, and the knowledge that I have. Uh, I become the rate limiting step. If every student is a knowledge keeper and every student can make new knowledge, and share that knowledge and that knowledge can move around the room, then we have a thinking classroom. It's the same thing with teachers. If, if I'm the only keeper of what makes building thinking classrooms, then this world is in trouble because it can only move at my ability to micromanage your dance routines. It needs to go beyond me and needs to go to the teachers and the teachers need to work it like a problem. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's interesting that and, you know, this is in no way shaming the, the teachers that I had or the teachers that came before us because we all do the best that we can with the knowledge that we have. Um, but mm -hmm. many of us are products of non-thinking classrooms. And so there's a lot of discomfort. There's a lot of, um, you know, like what yeah. could go wrong or what could happen going into implementing a, or not even implementing, of building a thinking classroom um, that can feel really uncomfortable when you are not used to thinking about math truly yourself I mean, your own experience. So it's to some extent, it feels like building a thinking classroom is also like building a thinking, like teaching practice. Like you have to, <laughs> we have to grow in our, our yes. ability to think about the math concepts and not just read yeah. what the curriculum says that we need to teach. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I was teaching a lesson yesterday and with a whole bunch of teachers observing, I think we had 15 teachers observing and uh, it was a grade five lesson. And one of the teachers pointed, I was co-teaching with a teacher and um, one of the teachers who was observing pointed out at the end of the, of the lesson when we were doing the debrief, she said, I noticed that you and the teacher, you met in the middle of the room and you changed some of the tasks on the fly, you discussed it and you changed some of the tasks on the fly. And, and, and she talked about building thinking classrooms as being responsive. And, and my answer to that was absolutely, right? Like we have to be responsive to what the room is giving us in that moment. We have to be nimble. We have to be able to adapt constantly to this. 
all the teacherly craft that we have built up through our career, we still need. So the reality is that thinking classrooms is very nimble, very dynamic, very responsive. Uh, we need to adapt in the moment to what the room is giving us. Uh, we may have a sequence of tasks and so on and so forth. But that's, but we still anticipate what's going to happen. We, we still plan our lesson ahead. And, and the challenge with anticipation, there are two challenges with anticipation. Number one, teachers, by and large, my experiences are fatalists. Um, we anticipate the absolute worst thing that can happen. We triple it and then we control for it. Right. And I get that because if things go wrong, it's we're by ourselves in that room, right? Like the teachers on their own with 30 students and we don't want things to go badly. We don't want them to go badly for the students. We don't want them to go badly for us. So our anticipations are always somewhat fatalistic. Um, and my experience with teachers is, is often that that doesn't yeah. say that, they're not optimistic. It doesn't say that they're not hoping for the best. It just says that they have to create a lived reality for students that, that is positive. Um, the second issue with anticipation is that anticipation, when we anticipate what we're going to do in a lesson, um, our anticipations often fall far short of the reality of what actually happens. There's been a bit of a panacea built to the importance of anticipation as a way to prepare for a lesson. But when we try to anticipate, we're, we're looking at our lesson through a keyhole and it, we're looking at it through our interpretation of how the task will be solved and so on and so forth. But the reality of the classroom is that it's going to bring to bring us a, a diversity that is not possible to anticipate. Um, we may have thought our way through that lesson. We may have thought about the task and how students are going to solve it, but we're going to see diversity that goes well beyond that. Um, I always say that anticipation prepares us for about 10% of what's going to happen. The other, then, then we're going to have to rely on experience, our experience, our professional craft to be able to adapt to what actually brings the, the room brings us. But then that experience helps us anticipate more effectively the next time. Right. And then the next time we do something, that experience helps us anticipate more. So anticipation is in its first instantiation only prepares us for about 10 percent. Um, we need experience as well which creates a sort of bootstrapping problem. How do we prepare ourselves to do a thinking classroom lesson? We prepare ourselves to do a thinking classroom lesson by doing a thinking classroom lesson. And that will yeah. prepare us more to do the next yeah. one. And, and I have this saying that the second time we do something is always is way better than the first, but not nearly as good as the third. And I think that's where it can be really challenging, especially if you are like, for me, I'm a perfectionist through and through. I don't claim that in a positive way whatsoever, because I think it can hold me back. But especially when you are a perfectionist and you want to get it right, it can feel very scary or just there's a lot of hesitation with you. You'll get better with experience. And so I think that's where it requires a lot of like grace and being okay oh. that like, I'm going to do this. It's likely not going, it, it it's, likely not going to go the way that I've planned it. And that can be a beautiful thing, but I need to be okay yeah. with the way that it goes and know that I've prepared, you know, to the best of my abilities. So perfectionism in, in that regard is, it can hold people back, but it can also create amazing lessons. It's just what you do with it, right? So I often get asked, what are the qualities of good teachers? And, and there's one quality that I say every single time. One of the, the quality, the, the best quality a teacher can have is the willingness to make mistakes in front of their students. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice if teachers came out of teacher education as excellent teachers, but the reality is that they don't, right? They, be, they come out as good teachers, but to become an excellent teacher, you have to work on your teacherly craft. You have to work on your practice. And the only way you can work on your practice is to, is to take risks, to try things. And, and if you're not a willing to make mistakes in front of your students, it's going to be really hard for you to do that. Now, the good news on that is, like, if you, if you go into a lesson and you're trying a new type of a launch or a new type of consolidation and it doesn't go well, I can promise you, 
I can promise you that the kids are not sitting around the dinner table that night going, whew, the teacher really <laughs> screwed up the consolidation today, right? Like you're going to be the only one who knows that. So you have to, you have to give yourself grace because mm-hmm. you will get better with time. The, the place I see that it can hold teachers back is I worked with a teacher one, once. I've worked with a couple of teachers like this, but one comes to mind. They were, a, they were a perfectionist. They planned the lesson down to every detail. And they, they, they did an incredible job thinking of every possible eventuality. And, and they kind of really anticipated and, and built a lesson to, to sort of circumvent and cut off and, 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 and cut short any problems and so on. It was a work of art. And then they went into the lesson and they willed their plan to come to fruition. So they just willed it to reality. And and I was in those lessons observing. And the problem with that was that the teacher never was responsive to what was happening in the classroom. It doesn't matter how good the lesson is. When you will it to come to reality, you're not being responsive. You're not listening to your students. You're not hearing what the room is giving you. And what that does is it prevents you from being better prepared the next time because you learn nothing from that experience. You willed it to go the way you wanted. You learn nothing from that experience means you're not going to be any better the next time because you're not listening to the room. So we go in with our anticipation, but we learn from our experiences and we learn in the moment. We learn after the moment. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I I appreciate you sharing that story. Um, When we did the book study this summer, we talked a lot about there are some teachers who are very type A and they like to be under control. And that is a a huge thing that has to be released in a thinking classroom. Control over the, the space, control over students are going to do this at this time. But I love that word responsive because we're, we're trading the control for the responsiveness. And I think that that's, it's, more fruitful, it's beautiful, and I think it just provides for a more dynamic learning environment. And so when we um, move to that place of being responsive, I think it's normal when anytime we're trying something new and we're releasing that control, um, it's normal for us to hit like a point of being stuck. And so I would love to hear from you if there is um, a frequent place in teachers building a thinking classroom where they get stuck And what is like your advice or what have you seen for that teacher to get unstuck from whatever that stuck point is? All right. So there's a, there's a number of places that teach ways that teachers get stuck and places that they get stuck. So the first place they get stuck is say do thinking classroom like once a week, thinking Thursdays, or (laughs) uh, we're going to do it on Fridays or something like that. Um, So it becomes this sort of, otherness. So there's math that we do. And then we do this thinking classroom thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I often hear this from teachers. Oh, I do it once a week or I do it twice a week or as if it's something other than math. And then they, and then they're surprised that the students don't, that they don't get to reap the rewards that I talk about in the book. Right. It's like, if I go jogging once a month, I'm not going to ever get to that point where jogging starts to pay off and I, I start right. to enjoy jogging and so on and so forth. It's the same thing with a thinking classroom. They do it intermittently and then they, and then they don't really see the benefit that causes, that may trigger them to want to do it more frequently. So that's one place teachers get stuck. Another place they get stuck is that they implement the very beginning part of thinking classrooms. So it's like they, they take thinking classrooms as a, uh, a, a task, a random groups and vertical surfaces, and they view thinking classrooms as being only that. So maybe I'll give a thinking task at the beginning of the lesson. We'll do that for 15 minutes. And now it's back in your seats. we got to get on with the business. Or I'll do the lecture, my lesson, the way I normally do. But when it comes time to doing the practice problems, I can send them in random groups to the boards. Again, that's not what thinking classrooms is. And it's easy to get stuck there because you do see benefit. You're going to see benefit in both of these cases. The kids enjoy thinking classrooms. They're going to like thinking Thursdays. They like going to the boards and doing their practice there. 
you're going to see engagement. You may even see improvement in student performance and so on. So it's easy to get fooled into thinking that, yes, that's what it is. And then you get stuck there, right? Um, both of these things, if you get stuck there because you're seeing benefits, is um, r- reminds me of something called an oasis of false promise. So <clears throat> David Perkins, who ran Project Zero at Harvard for years, wrote a book called Archimedes Bathtub. Uh, and it was about creative problem solving and how when you get stuck, um, what do you do about it? But he actually defined being stuck as four different ways that we can get stuck in something. And one of them is the oasis of false promise, which is that I do something, I see a benefit, and then I get stuck there. The way we get stuck at an oasis in the desert, right? Which is like when we're tra- traversing the desert, it's... it. You know, there's no water anywhere. There's no shelter from the sun. We are parched. And then we find an oasis. And the oasis gives us everything we need. But does it really? Because in order for us to survive, we actually have to leave the oasis. The oasis. We have to, we have to keep moving. So there's this oasis of false promise that, that he talks about. And I think that sort of fits this idea. I'm going to do it thinking Thursdays or I'm going to, I'm going to do do it for part of every lesson, but not as the main part of the lesson. Um, Another place teachers get stuck is they, they encounter some sort of resistance. Change is hard. Resistance can come from students, it can come from parents, it can come from peers, it can come from administrators. And couple that with a fragile professional sense of professional autonomy, it's it's easy to be backed off of something. Even if you believe in it, it's, um, you know, being a teacher is hard enough when everybody is swimming in the same direction as you. It's, it's even harder when we're swimming against everybody else. And another place it gets stuck, teachers can get stuck, is when they're working, and, and this is, they have no control over this, but they're working in a setting where, and I see this a lot, I see this, I call them two-headed monsters. Um, I recently worked in a district where the administrators were really on board for building thinking classrooms. We really want this. We want students to be thinking. And at the same time, they're going, you have to adhere to your pacing guide for your program. And we have a test coming up on Friday and this sort of thing that, 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 and I think these two headed monsters can arrive because we have multiple heads having different agendas, <clears throat> but it can also be the same person having different agendas. Administrators are also under pressure to, to move the needle on student learning and student performance. Um, so you, you can end up in that situation where your the, the external pressures to adhere to some sort of a structure that's not conducive to thinking classrooms is ever present. Um, when I always encourage teachers to do in those settings is to interrogate those pressures, those, those, those norms that are being pushed on you and interrogate them to see which ones are real and which ones are perceived because there are often real constraints that are being posed on you, but we tend to anticipate, we tend to perceive much more than are actually there. Um, yeah. And to wade through that and figure out what are the actual things I have to do and what are the things I just perceive that I have to do. Uh, because a lot of policy lives in, in perception. And the last place teachers get stuck is when they come up against assessment. Um, building Thinking Classrooms deals with assessment. There's three chapters on that. Assessment, more than anything else, has, has a lot of stakeholders in it, right? Like, how I launch a lesson, there's very few people who care about that other than me and what I'm doing in my classroom, right? Um, How I decide I'm going to make the groups, very few people care about that, right? Um, How I arrange the furniture in my room, very few people care about that. But how I'm going to generate that report card grade, a lot of people care about that. And so when we get to assessment, um, there's a lot of stakeholders and sometimes there isn't room in the policies to enact those things. Sometimes there is room, but you're going to meet resistance. But more than anything else, assessment 
is really requires a mind shift um, to, to, to make that transition into the assessment that I talk about in building thinking classrooms, which is fundamentally moving towards from an events-based grading to a standards-based grading, which is not mine. It's been around for a long time, but it requires a, a philosophical shift. So teachers are going to meet challenge there and they may get stuck there because they're not ready to make that philosophical shift. And I always tell teachers, do not try to do the assessment until you've made that philosophical shift. It's just, it's going to be trying to wear, right. it's going to be like trying to wear clothes that don't fit. I want to come back to the assessment piece because I had a question for you about that. But I, before I forget, you mentioned that very first place that you said that teachers get stuck is um, doing building thinking classrooms like once a week. And I, you know, I've worked with so many teachers who that is their story. They're like, oh, we do it, you know, two times a week. And I have some internal struggle in the sense of, you know, I wonder if it is a like low tolerance of discomfort because building thinking classrooms still feels uncomfortable. And so only doing it two days a week, it's like, okay, those are my two days that I can tolerate. And the other three days we go back to what feels comfortable. But it's interesting you talking about that, uh, what do you call it? The oasis of false False what was it? promise. False promise? Yeah, the oasis that gives, of false that gives promise. Me, yeah, that gives me another angle at like, oh, maybe that's what it is. They think, you know, like two days a week is working for us. But what would you tell the teacher? Because I do think there's a lot of teachers who are still in that place of just doing it a couple of days a week. What would you um, tell them or what would be your advice to like how to move yeah. forward from that? Or maybe why, what they're missing out on by only doing it two days a week? So... Part of I think part of the reason that people might be doing it two days a week rather than incorporating it fully into their practice is one of them could be institutional, right? Like I have to get through seven pages of the workbook and I only have time to do that if I do this once a week. Um, part of it could be that, you know, there's been this huge move. In, um, in education, math education around instructional routines. I love instructional routines. I love like which one doesn't belong and, and um, estimate 180 and um, uh, open middle. Uh, all of these are amazingly rich number talks or amazingly rich routines you can do for a short period of time or you can incorporate it more centrally into your teaching like open middle. Um, but one of the risks with these routines is that teachers see them as warm welcomes, uh, bell ringers, um, things they do at the beginning of the lesson, that it's not something that we teach math through. It's something we do in addition to our teaching of mathematics. And I think part of it is part of what could happen with this sort of I do it on Thinking Thursdays is that it's a view of this and that. I have to do this. And I'm going to do that rather than yeah. building thinking classrooms as the way we do this. Um, so there is always this risk around um, when, when we start to flood the market with a lot of instructional routines, these sorts of plug and play things that we can do. We can create this belief that these are, these are things that stand outside of how we teach math. But it's how we teach math. It's how we engage in thinking. And I think that's true of any one of the things I've mentioned, right? Number talks, which one doesn't belong, estimate 180, open middle, right? These are all ways that we can think about how we teach math. But if they're being picked up as this is what I do in addition to teaching math, it creates that sort of different view of what this is. And I think part of it is that's what building thinking classrooms has been for some people is that it's what I do in addition to teaching math. How do you, right. how do you counter that? It's, I think it's just about, okay, let's, let's, let's try to actually use building thinking classrooms to teach content. Let's try to actually enact it in the context of our content. This is, that's what I've been doing this week. This week I've been in classrooms and acting building thinking classrooms in the context of sometimes in non-curricular ways to build up that repertoire of experience, but also in, in, with curriculum and what curriculum, the curriculum they're doing today and what resource are we using? Whatever their book is, whatever their textbook or program is, let's extract from there and let's use building thinking classrooms as the way 
in which we engage in that work. That's fantastic. And that's the way that you described that as far as it not being something we do in addition to teaching math, it is how we teach math. That was fantastic. I know that there will be teachers who like that was a light bulb moment for them. So I really appreciate you um, explaining that. Okay, I've got some like rapid fire questions for you. Now I say that they're rapid fire. Okay. I don't know if they're actually going to be rapid fire because they're kind of like meaty questions, but my intention is that they'll be rapid fire. So okay. um, I asked my community what I, I gave just the closest teachers in the mix and math community. I said, I'm interviewing Peter Lilliedal. Like what questions do you have? And this was by and far like the number one question. So something I have quoted from your book over and over and over again is you said um, that a wide, a wide range of abilities is a defining characteristic of any classroom. Yet the number one question that I always hear from teachers about building thinking classrooms is how do I support my students with learning challenges or who are really, really lacking understanding? So why do you think that is the number one question and how would you answer it? Uh, well, I think the number one, I think it's the number one question for two reasons. One is empathy. I think teachers have a tremendous amount of empathy and care for their students. And, and the ones we care the most about are the ones that are on, on the fringes for, for us, right? The ones who are, we don't want anyone be, to be left behind. We don't want somebody to struggle or feel less than, or to, or to feel powerless in any situation, right? So I think part of it is empathy. I think part of it is also pragmatics. It's like, oh my goodness, how do I make this work, right? So um, how do I how do I make this work when when I want everyone to be doing this, but not all my students are capable of doing that? So I think it's equal parts of those. Um, and the answer to that is my answer to that is always the same, which is that you have students in your room who are going to need support. All your teacherly craft that you've developed over the years to provide students, diverse students with support, differentiated support, are still relevant here. The thing to remember, though, is that you don't yet know which students are going to need that support. Right. So one of the one of the overarching themes this week in the classrooms I was in, because one of the things that I always say when we, when we come out of the, the lesson, the first question I ask the teacher and then the rest of the room is, Tell me about a student that surprised you today. And the overarching theme all week has been, yeah, this student here normally has trouble focusing. They were really focusing. This student uh, is always is one of my weaker students and they were doing great today. This student who just came to our, my classroom last week, doesn't speak any English, was able to function, communicate and contribute today. So it's there's always this situation where something surprises us. Hopefully it's a positive surprise that that student who normally needs support was supported within their group and actually emerged as a leader. That's the other theme that comes out all the time. We did random groups. Normally this person struggles, but because of who they were with, they had to position themselves as a leader and they really flourished in that setting and so on and so forth. Um, but there could also be surprises the other way. So I was in a classroom last week where we had a group of three girls randomly put together in a group and I'd never met them before. I was doing the lesson and they were giggling and they were, they were reducing them into this giggles and so on and so forth. And we came out of that lesson and I said, before we, I open this up to what students surprised you today, I'm going to predict that at least two of the girls in that group that was really low functioning today, are some of your top performing students in your class. And the teacher was surprised by my observation of that because it turned out to be true. And it's, it's sometimes we're surprised by the fact that students that we perceive to be very strong are not strong. They're good at mimicking, they're good at, at playing the game of school, but not actually good at thinking. Uh, and this, I was asking them to think, and I was asking them to think in ways that are collaborative and they maybe aren't good at that either. Um, and they have a fragile ego around this. So then they evolve into goof, devolve into goofiness because that is safer than it is to reveal your, your true vulnerabilities. Students are going to need support. You just don't know which ones they are yet. Those two girls needed support that day, but those were not the ones the teacher predicted were going to need support. 
So we do provide support and that support comes in varying shapes and sizes, depending on what's going on. Maybe we step in and have a little bit more direct intervention within a group. Maybe we move the marker more. Maybe we, we say to a student, I did this the other day, there was a student who was really struggling and I handed her the marker. And I said, I know you have lots of ideas that you wanna share with your group, but I'm not gonna allow you to do that here. You're gonna hold the marker and your partners, you only get to write what your partners tell you. And the yeah. student was like, yeah, I have lots of ideas to share. Like she knows, she knew what I was doing. I was creating a space where she could be involved as a scribe and learn through being the scribe without being put into a position where she had to be made vulnerable because she doesn't have any ideas to contribute. So we have to find ways, whether that is um, supporting students prior to the lesson, whether it's ensuring that they have a role, working on the empathy of our students um, so that they can ensure that students feel belonging and, 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 and valued in their groups. We still have to do all that. Building thinking classrooms doesn't solve that. It's, I, I want to emphasize what you said, that we don't yet know what students need support. It reminds me of um, what came to mind when you were talking about that was Julie Dixon and her just in time, just in case versus just in time mm -hmm. scaffolding. And I think yeah. a lot of times going into lessons, it's like, okay, well, these students are going to struggle. So what can I do to prepare for that already? And um, I, I really like that, just that perspective of like, let's see what they do. Like I've, I've prepared, I've got skills from years of being a teacher, and I can trust that I can use those when they are needed, when a student demonstrates that they need me to step in and support them in this way. So um, that was a fantastic answer. I really appreciate that. I know the teachers in our community, that's been a question I've seen over and over and over. And so um, that was just, that was fantastic. Um, and not rapid fire, but that's okay. <laughs> so I've got a couple more you questions for you. rapid fire with me. No, you can ask that the is question okay. you quickly. Know, I take a look at answer. That's okay. I am not a rapid fire person anyway, so I don't even know why I thought that I could have a rapid fire section in here. Um, but you know, what I love about building thinking classrooms and just from listening to you on podcasts and things like that is that just as much as you've done years and years of research on this, you are still learning as you see this being implemented in thousands of classrooms. And so I would love to hear from you. Are there any new insights that you have post publishing the book um, that you can share with us? Is there something new that you've learned being in all of these classrooms and seeing it done? Oh, I've learned so much. Now, some of it is, some of it is like deliberate, like the book gets published. We've worked a lot on note making chapter 11, um, trying to get students it's trying to turn note making into a thinking activity as opposed to note taking as a mindless activity. I wasn't super happy with the results of that. Like statistically, we were we, we were getting way more thinking and the students were using their notes way more through the methods we use, but it was still excluding 20 to 40 percent of students uh, because they were opting out. So I kept working on that deliberately, and I've been working on that ever since the book came out. And Last May, new structures emerged that really show that the students, that, that we can get 100% of students involved and participating in note making. And that was, that was a result of something really deliberate. Um, sometimes it's, it's new insights that have come from the fact that I'm working in a different setting now. Right. Like when the research was done, I was going into classrooms where nobody knew what building thinking classrooms was. And we were doing research in sort of these this vacuum. And now when I'm in classrooms, I go into a school, everybody know, may know what it is and three people may be doing it. And so it's like I'm, I'm not working in a vacuum anymore. So that produces different things. And I suspect that if I was to do the research on what is the ideal implementation sequence now, it would be different. The results would be different. I haven't done that work yet, but I do believe that the results would be different than what is currently in chapter 15 of my book. But then there's other things that, that I didn't notice were so different that are turning out to be really different. So I'll give you a, a really concrete example. Um, in our research, we found that random groups was best. Groups of three was best. And that the best way to group them was 
was in a way that was visibly random so that the kids could see the randomness and cards turned out to be a really good way to do that. It, it sort of checked all the boxes. They can pick a card. They have that agency as to which card to pick. They know it's 100% random. They believe in it. There's inefficiencies with that. Kids lose their cards. We don't get them back. They crumple the cards. They swap the cards. Um, there's, there's all those sorts of things. So teachers also leaned into these digital randomizers, Class Dojo, uh, Picker Wheel, Flippity, things like that. And I wrote in my book that, okay, the cards seem to be the best, but and the randomizers are missing that perception of randomness, and you can heighten that by rolling a dice, and whatever the dice comes up, that's how many times you randomize. Um, and I thought that was it, right? Like it wasn't, it, the kids didn't seem to be as enamored with it as taking a card. That seemed to be more exciting to them, but it produced a whole bunch of efficiencies for teachers. Kids weren't swapping the cards and so on and so forth. And I thought, okay, all right, it's not as good, but it's not that bad. My, 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 my thinking of that has changed completely in the last year. Oh, wow. Um, I've, I've been in a lot of classrooms where teachers are using digital randomizers. And there is something really tragic that happens with that. And I don't mean in a, in a sort of ineffective way or in an inefficient way. I mean like in an emotional way. So anybody who's listening to this who uses a digital randomizer, if you... When you hit that randomizer and appears on the screen, ask yourself, do you ever hear Ugh, or Ugh, or no or <laughs> right? Like if you hear those, even if they're really subtle, those are forms of microbullying yeah. and and they are cutting deep and. And bullying is usually something that, that lies under the surface, that happens in really secluded ways that there isn't a large audience for. So a student may feel traumatized by bullying, but it but it's happens with a small number of people. The problem with the microbullying that happens here is that it's incredibly public. So that when that person laughs or grunts or groans, Everybody in the, the student knows who did it. They know exactly who they're doing it about. Everybody in the, and they know that everybody in the room knows. Everybody knows. And the teacher isn't doing anything about it. The teacher may say, okay, I don't want to hear any of that stuff, but yeah. it's going to be really hard to get rid of it. And even if you get rid of all the, the auditory stuff, and good luck with that, because kids are just going to go, well, I thought of something funny, or I stuck my toe, or I was just exhaling. There's always going to be a way for them to, to excuse their, their expressions. There's also the glances. And the glances are incredibly negatively impactful as well. And it, it cuts deep. The kids who are being microbullied in that setting are are traumatized by that. Um, we don't get that with the cards at all. Um, when a student takes a card, they have no idea who they're who, who's in their group until they get to their group. Right. And then they may have a negative reaction to that, but usually they don't express it because there's no audience to hear it be expressed exactly. anymore. Exactly. Uh, and even if they do say, oh, there's no audience to hear it, so it doesn't get amplified through that sort of public milieu. So it's yeah. my my thinking on this is being in classrooms where I'm seeing this, it's it's just it's changed completely. I do not endorse using a digital randomizer. Now I know it's more efficient, but I've only ever met a handful of teachers who have been able to effectively shut down all sort forms of microaggression in that setting. There are usually at very young grades, the kids react to it really positively, but everywhere else I, I see some form of microbullying happening with it. And I didn't say, I didn't set out to look for that. It's just something that hit me in the face when I started being in more and more classrooms where teachers were using this. Well, and you know, I think in order to have a successful thinking classroom, it has to be a safe classroom. And oh, the totally. inefficiencies that come with cards are worth the um, the damage that that interaction has on the, the, the safety and yeah. um, 
feeling welcome in the classroom. So I really appreciate you uh, sharing that because I know that there, there are always people, really creative teachers who want to throw out different ideas of like, oh, well, here's how I have yeah. doing this and here's how this is working. And, you know, that's not something that I would have ever thought of. So I appreciate you, you sharing that. Yeah, we didn't, I didn't think of it either. And, you know, in all the research, I was doing the cards with all the research. And then it was teachers who were saying, well, I do this and I do that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that seems it, it ticks the same boxes if you make these small adjustments. But now that I'm in those classrooms where teachers are doing it, I'm, I'm seeing something different. Uh, you're right. Yeah. I think in classrooms, students have to feel safe. Um, I all, I've always said that cruelty is one of the only things that can shut down a thinking classroom because cruelty puts everybody on edge. And yeah. we just have to avoid those opportunities for cruelty to emerge. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So closing us out today, one of my favorite parts in the, actually, I, I say that everything in the book is my favorite parts. If you looked at my book, it's, I'm a very poor highlighter. I'm the person in high school who highlighted everything. And so, um, but in, in this end, there's like a forest to the trees section and you say, it's so easy to become consumed by the importance of each practice that we lose sight of the overall objective to get students to think. If students are not thinking, they are not learning. And so I would love for you to close us out with just what's a challenge or a call to action that you'd like to leave the teachers who are watching this interview with? Wow. Okay. So that's twice you've pulled out something from the end of something I've written and... Uh, <laughs> And, and then you ask me to, to, to comment on it. And both times it was like, that would have been the perfect closing. Um, so I, don't, I think well, that I anything can, I have to say now is that. not <laughs> as powerful as that. But I will say this. Um, and I'm going to come back to what we talked about earlier and pull a couple of things together. If students are not thinking, they're not learning. We got to get them thinking. Okay, That's, that is the forest. We have to get them thinking. Um, Building Thinking Classrooms offers you a, a set of practices that can help you create an environment that is more conducive to thinking. But it's not a dance to which I am the only one who holds a choreography. It's a problem for you to solve. And you have to work the problem. We have to try to get our students to think. And, and, and the only other thing I will say, coupled with that, is that always... Always go into that debate with yourself about the tension between the effective and the efficient, right? Yeah. It's like we just talked about. There are things that are efficient and there are things that are effective. And we can't do only the things that are effective if it creates so much inefficiency that we can't sustain it. Likewise, there's no point doing things that are only efficient if it has no positive impact on students. So yeah. it's always about trying to find that balance between efficiency and effectiveness and try to skew that more to effectiveness. It becomes more efficient with time, even if it's not at the beginning. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so very much. I could honestly talk to you for hours. You are brilliant. I am so appreciative of the work that you are doing and have been doing for decades in math education. Um, I cannot wait to see all of the new insights that you have. I cannot wait to hear from our teachers, just everything that they've learned um, from this interview. But thank you so much for giving up your time today to chat with me um, about math. Oh, my pleasure. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for, thanks for hosting me and inviting me.